I'm Dr. Jessica Parker. I'm the owner of Dissertation by Design and the Academic Writing Center. Today, I'm going to talk to you about developing your voice, specifically by leveraging the power of paraphrasing, uh, writing claims through your analysis and synthesis of the literature, and then synthesizing literature. So with that said, we're going to break down this idea of voice by first talking about the characteristics of voice, and then we're going to talk about these different ways that you can strengthen your voice as a writer, whether you're a research writer or a technical writer. We'll talk about five steps to effective paraphrasing, how to analyze literature to write claims, how to synthesize literature, and then we're going to transition over to a live demo so you can see how you can apply um, in vivo and Satavi to some of what I'm talking about today. So I added this table kind of last minute because so this year we are including technical writers in the Writing Institute. And so I thought it would be helpful to just quickly point out some key differences between research writing and technical writing. I'm not sure how many of you here today are in the technical writing category or vice versa. Um, but most of what I'm talking about today and tomorrow is, apl is applicable to both research and technical writing. But in, in terms of differentiating the two, I have these characteristics on the side, purpose, audience, tone, structure, use of evidence. And then I have some examples of different sort of outputs associated with these two types of writing. But when we think of research writing, we're contributing to a knowledge base. We're sharing knowledge with the wider academic community. We're typically communicating with other scholars and experts in our field. Our tone is often formal and objective. It's also very persuasive which I'm going to get into tomorrow. I'm going to help you um, develop compelling arguments through persuasive writing. Uh, research writing also follows a much more traditional academic structure. Um, I think of like the MRAD frame, framework, introduction methods, results, discussion, slash conclusion. As a researcher, we typically rely on um, evidence from like primary and secondary sources to support our claims. And we're typically producing these research or scholarly papers, dissertations, or grant proposals. Technical writing is a bit different. Uh, the purpose of technical writing is usually to inform and educate a very specific audience about like a product process or concept. The audience is typically professionals and consumers. The tone is typically formal, clear, concise, concise and informative, and it can be persuasive, which again, I'll talk about tomorrow. The structure, there's a variety of different structures. There's no single sort of accepted structure. Uh, the evidence can come from a variety of sources, including the author's own experience and expertise. And then examples of technical reports could be a user manual, a product specification, or training materials. And so even though you might not think about it, voice is a component of technical writing. And so I'm going to give some examples today of both these two writing types and how what I'm talking about would apply. So when I talk about the concept of voice, I'm specifically talking about your unique perspective and style. In research writing, this voice, your voice is used to establish your credibility and expertise. And in technical writing, your voice is used to make the information that you're writing about very clear and easy to understand, very practical. So when we think about these characteristics of voice, I think it's helpful to use the analogy of like building a house. A blueprint for a house could example be the clarity. So just as blueprints provide a clear and precise layout for a house, you need clear and concise language to help you articulate com complex ideas. So clarity is an important component of your voice. There's also stance. This is your attitude toward the subject you're writing about. And so just as the foundation of a house gives it stability, your stance gives your argument or narrative a really firm foundation. Consistency is also important. Think about building a house. You don't want to design a modern home and then choose materials that are for a ranch style home. And so Having consistency in your style, your tone, and your stance contributes to a distinct voice. And it's important to maintain that consistency within a piece of writing. It, that doesn't mean that your voice can't shift over time, but within a certain piece of writing, you want to be consistent. Another characteristic of voice is your authority. So just as a well-built house showcases the expertise and knowledge of its builders through quality construction materials, 
An authoritative voice in your writing demonstrates your expertise and knowledge on the subject matter. So we tend to see an example of this as hedging. We tend to see more advanced writers who have more experience tend to use maybe less hedging in their writing as a novice researcher. Uh, authenticity is another important characteristic of voice. This is unique to you, just as you, know, you think about a house, you design the interior according to your own personality and taste. The authenticity in your writing reflects your personality, experiences, and values. And so all together, a piece of writing by yourself compared to a colleague, even if it's on the same topic, might look quite different. And so as I mentioned earlier, our voice changes. So maybe your the authority in your voice um, is not as prominent right now because this is your first time conducting research. Uh, that will change over time, the practice and experience. But when I talk about voice changing in, in this specific context, I'm talking about what you're writing. So I have this quote here, just as you dress differently on different occasions as a writer, you assume different voices in these different situations. Um, and so you're making decisions about your voice based on what you're writing. So the way you write in a research manuscript might be quite different than perhaps an editorial. So for example, I'm writing an editorial right now for the Chronicle of Higher Education, and my voice in that piece is much different than the research manuscript I just submitted to a statistics education journal. And so this is an example of what I mean by that. This could be the exact same writer, but these are two different um, sort of outcomes, sort of outputs, writing outputs. So this, uh, let's say it's an editorial on teaching to the test. You don't need to read this. I, I put some important words in red so that they stand out to you. Um, even though it's the same topic, the manuscript, the language is much different. And that's because the voice is completely different. Your audience is different. The purpose of the text is different. The tone changes. And so you see terms like in an editorial that's much more maybe opinion-based, terms like robbed, joy of learning, freedom to educate, hollow exercise, mere score chasing. These are not necessarily uh, words and phrases that you would expect to see in a research manuscript on teaching to the test. You would expect to see language such as much debate or critics argue, breadth and depth of learning. So again, this is a perfect example of how voice changes. So when I talk about voice today, I'm not advocating for you to sort of choose one lane, one voice per se, and stick with it. Rather, I want you to understand how to develop your voice and how it needs to adapt based on your audience, who you're writing to, and what the purpose of that writing is supposed to, what is essentially the goal of the writing. So with that said, there are ways to develop your voice. Um, one is reading widely. So just reading as much as possible and reading critically. We're going to talk more about reading critically in a moment. Learning how to paraphrase effectively is really important for developing your voice. Analyzing and synthesizing evidence, getting comfortable with um, learning to be the expert, so feeling comfortable critiquing the literature or critiquing the evidence or results that you're, um, that you're looking at, that you're reading, and synthesizing that evidence so that it's easier to digest for the reader. And then just practice. There's really no replacement for uh, practicing your writing. And throughout this process, getting feedback is really, really important to the process of developing your voice. So let's break the, this down just a bit. I'm going to start with um, effective paraphrasing. And so paraphrasing does enhance your voice because it, it forces you to familiarize yourself with the material and then rewrite it in your own words. It really keeps the passage of Paraphrase passages keep the momentum of your writing moving forward. You may not realize it, but as a reader, if you're looking at really anything, a manuscript, even if it's a technical report, quotations inherently kind of stop the flow of the writing. And so by removing those quotations and paraphrasing, you're able to keep that momentum moving forward. And by paraphrasing, you're showing the reader, if you're a student, you're showing your instructor, your professor, that you clearly understand the source material and you can speak authoritatively on it. Paraphrased passages are also rhetorically versatile. 
They help you communicate main ideas and or evidence. You use paraphrases as uh, analytical extenders and examples, elaborators. And it also helps you clarify technically and conceptually difficult passages for the reader. So through the process of you reading, thinking about what the source is saying, and then putting it to your own words, maybe the first time you paraphrase, it's not perfect, but over time you start to get better and better at it and get faster at it. And then your readers definitely appreciate that because as a reader, um, we want you to do the hard work of communicating the ideas to us. And so it's your job to break down those complex ideas for your reader. So here's just a, a very simple example of how you could take evidence, which I have in bold and italics and attach a claim to it. And you're, you're basically saying the same thing, but you're using the evidence differently, the way you're paraphrasing that evidence. And so there isn't necessarily a reason to use one or the, over the other. It just kind of depends on what you're writing and where, in, in this example, this information fits within the other writing, within whether it be a paper, a dissertation, or a report. But some people, especially who are emulating the works of their mentor or supervisor, or maybe you found a target article in a journal that you keep going back to, um, maybe in that model article that authors tend to write in the same way, where it's always evidence stacked on top of a claim. That doesn't mean that that's the only single way to do that. It just means maybe that's the author's sort of preference. And so a lot of this is preference. But at the end of the day, the act of paraphrasing itself is not a preference. It is required for strong writing, especially as you begin to develop your voice and an authority in your field. So I get this question a lot, and I know my students tend to love these rules of thumbs around quotes. Like, how many times can I quote in my dissertation or in this research paper? And I, and I don't like to give them an answer because there is no perfect answer. I know some professors will say no more than one quote per page. Some will say that you can't use any quotes, um, but I think there is a time and a place for direct quotations. And so I have here, the one that I tend to go back to is if the original language is really vivid, strong, and engaging, or if it's famous, then use the direct quote. Or maybe you're, there's a string of precise data that you need to reference specifically in a technical report. If it's research writing, unless you're you know, comparing your exact results to another person's, it's better to interpret those results and write about them, but that's a different conversation. Or if maybe the person who, the original source, if their words would strengthen your argument, then you could use that as a direct quote. But for the most part, you want to paraphrase. And when you're paraphrasing, your goal is to convey content. But if you're looking at the, the quote that you're, or the source's material, whether it be a direct quote or not. Um, usually the words within that direct quote are not particularly compelling and you can convey that content in another way in your own words. Um, it's also really important to paraphrase when there are complex concepts. Like I said earlier, it's your job to break down those complex ideas for the reader. And there's usually no reason to read the particular exact words of the original author. I was just reading something earlier today and. Um, there were quite a few quotations in within the text, and I asked the student to go back and really think about the message they are trying to convey, because it's really hard to read when a, a paper when, you know, every two sentences is a direct quote. I'm constantly wondering, you know, why is this person being quoted? Who is this author? Why are these words so important over others? And so this idea of framing quotes, if you are using a direct quote, is really, really important to show why you're citing this author. Maybe it's a seminal author. Um, otherwise, it just reads to me, and for most experienced researchers or professors, that perhaps you're not comfortable with the material and you don't feel confident paraphrasing. So be intentional is my message here. And so how do we paraphrase? For some of you, it might be very intuitive. Maybe you don't even have to think about paraphrasing. You just do it. But for some people, paraphrasing is really, really challenging. And so I broke this down, and this is not necessarily novel. You can find a lot of you know, guidance online about how to paraphrase. You can really break it down into five steps. So obviously, you're reading first. And you might need to read something several times before you're ready to paraphrase it. 
But as you're reading, you're taking notes and then you're using those notes to rewrite the source material in your own words. So you're looking at your notes and you're rewriting. That is a really critical step, but it requires you to read and have comprehension um, during that first step. And then after you take what you've rewritten, you go back and review the original source and you compare what you have to the original source just to make sure that you didn't you know, unintentionally change the meaning. If you did, or, or if you see that something's off, then go back to your notes, rewrite again, and then you insert and cite. And this is also really important. I had someone contact me the other day and they were in quite a bit of trouble for plagi being, they were accused of plagiarism. And it's because they, they weren't citing their sources and they were a bit confused. They thought that because they were paraphrasing and they weren't putting the information, they weren't using direct quotes that they didn't have to cite, but that is not true. You're still borrowing someone else's ideas and paraphrasing those. So you should be citing your sources. So now we're going to move on to writing claims. So we know that paraphrasing requires you to comprehend what you're reading, and put it into your own words in order to communicate whatever message you're trying to send to your reader. But within that process, you are, you should be writing claims. We're going to talk more about claims tomorrow because they are a core component of academic arguments, but we're also going to just address some basic components of them today and how to write them. So a claim is just a declarative sentence proposing a truth that is open to debate. And don't worry, I'll give you some examples if this seems foreign to you. Claims should be supported by evidence. And in order to write claims, you're drawing inferences from the literature or maybe the available evidence for your study results um, in order to develop those claims. And a claim can be simple or it can be complex. And so let's look at an example here of a simple and a complex claim. So this is my cat, Piper, Piper Parker. And I created a simple claim about cats and then a complex claim about cats. So this is very simple. This claim, this simple claim does not require logical reasoning and argumentation, but a complex claim does require logical reasoning and argumentation. And again, I'll get into that more in depth tomorrow when I talk about developing compelling arguments, but hopefully this makes it clear in an everyday life example, what the difference is between a simple and a complex claim. Now I'm going to use an academic example. Here's another simple claim, burnout in nurses increased during the pandemic. And then here's the evidence that someone could use to back up this claim. In this study, burnout increased from 35 to 79% in nurses pre to post pandemic. So this claim, you might have numerous simple claims within your document you should have a mixture of simple and complex claims. And so a complex claim here is burnout in nurses is caused by a myriad of factors of which staff shortages and work-related stress led to the most significant increase in burnout during the pandemic. And why is this complex? Is because it requires logic and argumentation to demonstrate that staff shortages and work-related stress are the two greatest factors that contributed to burnout in nurses during the pandemic. And so you obviously won't have to have evidence to back up this complex claim. And like I, I mentioned just a moment ago, in terms of you know, how many simple and complex claims you have in your document, there's no rule of thumb for that. But I will, I will give you a sort of tip or hint. If you've been told that you are covering too many main ideas or topics within a paragraph, then you're likely trying to do too much with your claim. Your claim is probably too complex and it needs to be broken down into multiple simple claims so that you're not stuffing one paragraph with too many main ideas. So how do we get there? How do we get to the point of writing either a simple or a complex claim? Well, first you're gathering evidence. You're doing this through reading, reading widely and reading critically. You're taking the evidence that you're gathering, whether it be from the literature, whether it be from your individual study results or anecdotal evidence, if you're writing maybe a technical report and you're analyzing it. And I'll, I'll tell you in a moment what you're analyzing it for. And you take what you analyze and you draw inferences and conclusions, and then you write the claims. And through this process, this is a great example of how you're developing your voice. You're demonstrating that 
you feel comfortable looking at the evidence that is available, analyzing it, drawing your own conclusions from it, and then making claims about that evidence. Now, these claims might very much be in alignment with existing claims within the literature. That's perfectly fine. They may also be completely in your own words based on your synthesis of the evidence. That's fine too. So there's also no rule of thumb in terms of every claim should have a citation or not. That's just not true. It's just very highly dependent upon the context. So a tip for writing claims, I'm not going to read this out loud, but when I write claims, if I'm writing, I will layer my evidence under the claim before I start writing in paragraph form. And this is helpful because it, I can visually quickly assess how much evidence I have to support a claim. It also makes it easy if you just initially write it this way, you can sort of look at your sources, look at the dates. And if you see maybe some older dates, some older citations, you can kind of ask yourself, is this important to include? Maybe this is a seminal work, because that's sort of things that reviewers are thinking about, whether it be a professor or a journal reviewer. Um, if you're going through the peer review process, we're not only looking at the evidence to support your claim, but we're also looking at um, the sources themselves. Are these you know, sources appropriate for the claim that's being made? Are they outdated or are they current? Maybe they're seminal. And so just writing in this way initially in a list form helps me sort of make those assessments very quickly. Okay, yes, so how do we get there? I'm gonna break this down a bit. So create a matrix. I actually have a QR code here because this could be a whole presentation in and of itself, how to create a literature make, matrix and analyze it for similarities, patterns, trends, so if you scan that, it'll take you to a YouTube video that a member of my team filmed several years ago about how to create an annotation table, also called a literature matrix, and use it to help you um, look for all of these different similarities, patterns, and trends so that you can move on to the process of writing claims based off of what you're seeing within your literature matrix. I'll give you just a second in case you want to scan that. And this will also be included um, as a handout, so you'll have access to this. And so let's just kind of imagine that you've gone through the process of, you know, creating this literature matrix. It's probably going to look much, much larger than this. I know my literature matrix um, for the most recent study that I conducted um, was quite extensive. So if you imagine you've gone through the process of analyzing the literature within that matrix, you're now um, kind of moving on to this next step of synthesis. And synthesis is, you know, these are all very interrelated. So you have to kind of synthesize to write claims, um, but you also have to be familiar with the literature overall in order to synthesize. So it's a very like iterative cycle. It's not a linear process. And so I talked earlier about critical reading and we're going to jump back into that in just a moment. But I want to just take a moment and we're going to do our final poll. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Do you feel that synthesizing literature is a key part of developing your unique writing voice? So Stacey, if you could launch that poll for me. It's thinking. <laughs> I'm trying to launch it. Yeah, we're doing it. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Yeah, it's trying to launch. Sorry, it's a little delayed. Okay. Hmm. It's being difficult. We can skip over it. Try it. Let me try one more time. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't seem to want to do it. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No worries. I'll close it out. Okay, we're going to skip this. Oh, now it's oh, I'm seeing it. It's so I'm now seeing it's it now. It's Laura. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is it working now? Yeah, now it is. I don't know why I can't see it. I'll share it in a minute. Okay. <laughs> okay I'll end poll and share. Hey, okay. 
So we're about split. Well, 45% very much so. It is a key part of developing your voice. Absolutely, 38% somewhat. Hope I can convince you that it is absolutely part of developing your voice. And then 1% not at all. I certainly, I certainly hope to change your mind. <laughs> um, so why is it a key part of developing your voice? Well, if you have experienced synthesizing evidence, or maybe it's something you're struggling with, it's challenging because it requires you to make a new whole out of the parts. You can't begin synthesizing literature, at least well, if you've only read you know, two or three articles on a topic. Part of becoming an expert means that you've gone into the literature and you can confidently say that you have read uh, all of the available literature that is directly relevant to your topic. And by doing so, you're able to take, if you think of each study as a, as a part, you're able to draw inferences and conclusions and to make a new whole out of the parts. And so how do we do that? Well, we do it through critical reading and we do it, we do it through writing. There's really no shortcut for this. I am very aware, I'll say, of the uh, generative AI tools that are coming out every day. I'm using several of them. I'm testing them. And they are very helpful for synthesis. But I'd say a, a word of caution is if you don't already know, if you're not yet familiar with the literature in your field, then I think it's a dangerous game to rely on these technologies to synthesize for you because you have no way of evaluating what they're suggesting, that the content they're generating to know if they're accurate because they are not always accurate. But if you are an expert in your field, if you're a more seasoned researcher and you're very familiar with the evidence that is available, then yes, they can be incredibly helpful. They can give you new insights and perspectives, help you, you know, brainstorm different ideas, see things from, you know, an angle that you may not have considered before. But if you're just getting started, say writing a dissertation or a thesis, um, or maybe you're transitioning, you know, your, your research trajectory to a different sort of aspect of your field, then I definitely don't recommend relying on those tools to, to synthesize for you um, because you don't have a good grasp of all of the parts yet. So you can't yet, you know, make a new whole. So ultimately the, the result of synthesis is you, you're contributing by putting forth your new understanding or perspective. And it can be very unique to you, or it could be maybe your unique perspective based on a, another recent perspective in your field. It doesn't have to be necessarily, you know, novel or something no one has ever you know, thought of before. But like I said, in order to do this, you're critically reading and you're writing. So I'm just going to touch on critical reading for a moment because I think that this is important. Critical reading involves um, questioning what you're reading and connecting ideas across sources. It is time consuming. And so I, I find that some folks want to cut corners and you really can't cut corners in order to be able to synthesize well. Uh, so through this process of critical reading, you're not believing everything at face value. You're, you're recognizing that what you're reading presents ideas rather than truths. Um, and then you're learning and you're making new meaning out of what you're reading. And this is time consuming. But as a professor, as a researcher who works with scholars all over the world at all levels, I can tell in someone's writing whether or not they've taken the time to comprehend what they're writing about and whether or not they fully understand it. And people who take the time to do that are engaging in critical reading. And so there is a direct connection between critical reading and strong writing. So through this process of critical reading, as you're transitioning to writing, you're responding and you're interacting with the text. You're not just reacting to it in a quick emotional way. You're responding to it by carefully studying the author's ideas, evaluating their arguments, considering counter arguments, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. And you're not just quickly responding in a, in a very binary way, like agree or disagree. You're really carefully evaluating what you're reading in light of everything else you've already read on that topic. And there's a wonderful um, resource here on research and critical reading um, that I highly recommend checking out. And you'll have access to this in the, um, in the PDF that Stacey will provide. 
And so through this process of transitioning from critical reading into writing, I think it's helpful to, before you sit down and you're trying to write whatever it is you're writing, whether it's a manuscript, a dissertation, a technical report, to start by writing some exploratory responses, just taking notes to capture your ideas while you're reading and not forcing yourself to like sit down and figure it out while you're staring at a blank page, um, writing for maybe something that's a bit more high stakes. And so this is what I'm going to end on today, my final sort of point around how you get to this point of synthesis and strengthen your voice is following a writing structure. There are several different types of writing structures available. I'm going to touch on three argumentative structures tomorrow, but today I'm just going to touch on the mill plan paragraph structure. One moment. So the reason I like this structure is because it forces you to analyze the evidence that you have and make connections between not just the evidence, but your ideas and the literature. It's really hard to skip over a component of, you know, the M-E-A-L, which I'm going to show you in a moment, when you know what it's supposed to look like. And so I find that this sort of writing structure is very, very helpful for novice researchers and seasoned researchers. So this is what the uh, M stands for. It stands for main idea. This can sometimes be a claim. E is evidence. This is the evidence you're using to support that main idea or claim. It can be your research. If it's a technical report, maybe your anecdotal evidence or experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. A is your analysis. So this is your analysis of the evidence. This is what can be really time consuming. And then the L stands for link or lead. So that final couple sentences could be linking what you've just provided to your the main idea of your maybe the overall thesis of your paper or uh, just leading to the next paragraph. So like a transition sentence. Let's look at two examples. I'm going to just sit this here for a moment. Um, this is a sort of meal plan paragraph that you would I would expect to see in a literature review. I have it color coded for you. I'm going to give you just a moment to read this and I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to point out some features. Okay, so hopefully you had time to read that. So all I did here was underline these different terms and phrases that I think are important to sort of take away from this. So this is clear here. It says one significant factor, and then the author states the factor, the therapeutic alliance. And then they repeat these key words over and over again. This keeps the reader on track with what factor you're talking about. And then when you see this transition, this is the lead to the next paragraph, they introduce something else, the patient's level of motivation and engagement. And so I'm pointing this out to you because if you are finding that you, maybe you've received feedback that your writing is not cohesive, it's poorly organized, you're trying to cover too much, then it may be that this first sentence, your topic sentence, you're trying to accomplish too much. Imagine here if I had said, you know, there are seven factors contributing to the effectiveness, and then I'm trying to you know, introduce a study for each factor. Well, perhaps you need to break out those factors into completely separate paragraphs because you're trying to cover too much information. What I think is also interesting here is how much analysis there is. And notice that in this scenario, in this example, the analysis does not contain citations. Sometimes it may, maybe you rely on another author's analysis of the literature in order to build your own analysis. Um, so you would have citations in that section, but this is the, I think the most time consuming part of the writing is 
taking time to reflect on what you've read, what you've noticed, and provide your analysis of the literature. So let's look at one more example, and then I'm gonna look at your questions. So this is an example of how the meal plan paragraph might show up in you know, the discussion section of an article where you're citing results from your study. I'll give you a moment to read this. Okay, so in this example, I, I highlighted some words and phrases as well. And so, as you can imagine, you know, this is one paragraph. If, the, if we were looking at the whole study, there may be, you know, six different research questions with different results for each question. And so you're, when you're discussing those results in light of the literature, it can be helpful to craft your discussion this way. So maybe within one paragraph, you're talking about one individual result. And you're comparing and contrasting that with the literature, which is your analysis, before moving on to another result, which is what they're doing here. They're about to transition to other factors um, that they found in their study. So again, we notice alignment between the, the sort of result they're focusing on and the language that's used in the analysis. Um, improved road safety is obviously linked to a decrease in traffic accidents and reducing accidents and the system's effectiveness and improve road safety. So these are more nuanced aspects of how to improve your writing, which we don't have time to focus on today. But I just also, I like to point out these different features because um, I think that they're important to notice. So with that said, I am done with the presentation. I am going to take your questions. Hey, Jessica, we have a lot of questions, okay. <laughs> a lot of interest, a lot of great feedback. Um, so let me go. Um, how? Uh, so this was more at the beginning of your presentation. How does one determine the right amount of hedging in their writing? Should hedging be determined based on the confidence within the articles reviewed or the data collected? Mm. So it's not quite as simple. It depends. So if you are, it also depends on what you're writing and where that writing is. So let's say you're in the literature, let's say you're writing a research manuscript and you're writing the literature review. Your hedging should, if you're writing about another author's ideas, first you want to make sure that what you're writing accurately reflects their intention in their writing so that you're not taking something totally out of context. And so if the author has strong argumentative language, the original source does, then the way you're talking about that author's work needs to reflect their sort of language in the original source. So that's like one layer of it. Another is if you are, let's say, because tomorrow we're going to talk about counter arguments. If you're building an argument based on maybe one author's work or a counter argument, then you might use hedging to hedge your own ideas, your own statements about what that argument is. So it doesn't have to be reflective of what that author said in the original sort of manuscript or book, whatever it is that you're um, developing a counter argument for. That's also a different context from you discussing your results and using hedging or not. And so it's highly dependent upon the exact context, what you're writing, whether or not you're interpreting another I author's ideas or not. Great, thank you. Um, question, um, how do you organize yourself with keeping notes of your reading? Do you keep notes in the document or in a separate Word document? So we will be showing you how to use Satavi software <laughs> for that. Um, but if you don't have software, I'm sure Jessica can give you some ideas, but that's one benefit of using software to organize and then help you with the citations. Yeah, for sure. Software definitely helps. Um, I find that if I'm, so I just started writing a research manuscript on a new topic. And so I was reminded of like the process of starting from scratch and how overwhelming it can be. 
And I found myself just starting out going into Word and making notes for each article and sort of attaching it to the article with a hyperlink in Google Drive. That is going to quickly get out of hand. And so I'm not going to continue relying on that process. Um, I think everyone, you know, sometimes I like to print it out and take notes, but ultimately um, it needs to be on the computer somewhere so I can easily access it later. So I do think um, like Satavi is a great resource for that, um, which Stacey, I know we'll show you how to use. Um, and how can I use the critical review matrix to arrive at a gap? How much can I read to be sure that I'm critical? And what if I agree with the authors contrary to questioning, which seems necessary in critical reading? Yeah, so you can agree with the authors. Um, I think what's more important there with critical reading is to make sure that you're not just agreeing for the sake of agreeing, that you're actually really thinking through your stance and that author's stance. Um, but certainly you can agree. I agree many times. I don't always have like a counter argument or a rebuttal. Um, sorry, what was the first part of that question? Oh, uh, just, um, if I think, uh, how can I use the critical review matrix to arrive at a gap? Mm, that's a good question. So a couple of things. So in that YouTube video, you'll notice the guidance that we give is we create a matrix for the, where that specific video is on the literature review. And so if you think of a, a traditional literature review and like a dissertation or a thesis, you might have four or five major strands of literature. The way that matrix evolves, the way I use it and the way I teach it is I'll develop a separate matrix for each strand of literature. And over time, as you're developing the matrix for each strand, you should just start noticing different gaps in the literature. You might not notice it through using the matrix, or you may. You may notice, like I used the literature matrix to, I already knew what one gap was in the literature, which was like in my problem statement. But through creating the matrix, I noticed that there was a methodological gap. And I noticed that by looking down the column of research design and methods that basically everything that had been done thus far was a survey, was a cross-sectional survey. And so that became an additional gap that I pointed out just by looking down the column. And so that's how we teach you to use that matrix in that video is through color coding within a column. And that can help you identify um, a gap. I also think if you're just getting started, a great way to identify a gap is to look at recommendations for future research and a recent article on your topic. That can help you kind of cut right to it. Um, do you have any tips on using active voice and minimizing passive voice in synthesis of articles? Yeah, so, I mean, some doctoral programs, so APA, says um, obviously active voice is preferred, but there are some doctoral programs. I was just reading a dissertation this morning and they want the student to use third person. And so sometimes it's just, it's, cha it's challenging to use active voice when you have to pay the researcher when you're talking in third person. Um, so there isn't a perfect way to do it if you are having to use third person, but I don't know, I use Grammarly Premium. It has helped me so much. So I used to be very prone to passive voice and I still have, it's like my natural way to just write. And so instead of resisting that, just write like you normally would, but then use technology to help you identify those instances of passive voice in your writing. And then if you use Grammarly Premium, like I do, um, and I know Word is even coming out with these different like generative AI features, um, it'll take you right to those instances of passive voice. And instead of just sort of correcting it without thinking about it, the more you pay attention to the suggestions and you're thinking about what's being changed, slowly over, over time, you'll start to write that way. But I don't always write that way. It's something that I still struggle with. So I just think write how you need to write. It's your first draft. They're not supposed to be good drafts. Um, and then leverage some of these technology out, technologies out here to help you improve. Great, thanks. So, um, well, uh, I'm presenting, and Laura's presenting. Um, Jessica can go through the questions and, and try to answer some, um, yeah. typing them. Uh, but uh, just because of time, we'll, we'll, if we're going to move on to now do the Satavi presentation, and that will be um, 
my part. And don't forget to go to the expo because then you can go to the dissertation by design booth and then other booths too for more questions. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. And first I just want to sort of um, show and uh, talk about the sort of how uh, Citavi and Vivo can be used. So um, Citavi, you'll see, is a reference management and writing tool. So it can organize your secondary sources. It helps you with the outlining, the synthesizing, task planning, formatting citations, and I would say paraphrasing too. Um, and then in Vivo is qualitative data analysis software that really helps you with your primary um, data you're collecting. So it helps, helps you analyze the sources, the coding, explore patterns, data visualization, and we have a transcription tool also. So they overlap because it's going to help you with your lit review, doing notes, collaborating, and writing. Um, and I won't go too deep here, but you can see when you're using both for lit review, uh, Satavi is going to help you through these stages, the organizational stages of your lit review, and then Vivo can help you even go deeper into your analysis. So I just wanted to set the stage because I'll be showing you how you can use um, Satavi for this, and then um, Laura will be going into in Vivo. So I'm just going to bring up Satavi. So you can see here, so Tavi, we have a desktop um, software for this and also web-based uh, software. So if you have a Mac, you'd want to use the, the Satavi web, uh, but they, they work in the same way. So I'm showing you the desktop. Uh, and I've I have a, a project here. I brought in um, some references. So you can see there's three main tabs in Satavi, reference, knowledge, and tasks. So in the reference, I have the references that I brought in and I can easily um, import references uh, from different databases. So if your university has a database you have access to, feel free to go there and you can import it right into Satavi or um, you can bring in PDF files. Or if you're already using some reference management software but you wanna switch over to Satavi, you can bring those projects you already have um, in like Zotero, Mendeley, or Ref works um, and note into Satavi. Uh, so once you have your references in Satavi, you can see the reference, the uh, met metadata here, the author, the title, the page number. So this is going to help you create those citations and bibliography. And then you also then can actually read your uh, article here and start highlighting it and working in it. So I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, another section of Satavi is the knowledge organizer, and this is really one of the strengths of Satavi because it helps you build out your writing, your outline. Um, so it helps you really with that first draft. So I created here, you can see an outline for introduction, methods, key themes, findings. So maybe I want to create a subcategory um, underneath methods. Um, and so on. So I can do that and, and start organizing it. And then the third tab is where you can organize your tasks. So you can assign yourself tasks to make sure you're, you're getting what you need done. But um, Satavi, you can, this is a cloud project I'm in. So you can invite other colleagues or team members to work on this with you um, on the same project. And then you can assign them tasks. So I'll just go back to references here. Uh, so I just want to show you. So some of what, um, or a lot of what Jessica um, was talking about is that um, Satavi can help you uh, really do the, the critical reading, the synthesizing, the paraphrasing while you're reading through, or you might want to go back at some point. But if I want to, I can go through here and start highlighting. So. Um, it depends on how you like to work. Uh, sometimes you might want to start highlighting areas. Okay, that's of interest to me. Um, and help your, oh, this is a good chart. I want to remember that. Uh, but I can also, with um, Satavi, is um, if I put go over these areas again and say, okay, um, I want to make sure that I assign this section either as a direct quote, an indirect quote, a summary, or a comment. Um, so for example, if I do want this as a direct quote, come here and I have a course statement. And the course statement is a way to help you um, uh, sort of 
ha have the main topic about um, this quote. So when you go to bring it <clears throat> and start writing about it, you remember what this is about. Um, and so I have this direct quote and I can even now bring it into that outline. So in this case, I'm going to put under key themes and click OK and I'll save it. Um, and so now when I go to the knowledge item and I go to key themes, you can see exactly what I just put in there. Um, but I can also, and this is where if you want to be able to uh, paraphrase, you can do an indirect a summary or an indirect quote. Um, and so at this level, you can even start in your own words um, saying what this uh, section of the text is about. Um, uh, well, you know, what uh, sort of taking what Jessica just uh, talked about with uh, paraphrasing or summarizing and being able to um, do that right in Satavi. So again, I'll, I'll add this to my and save it and so on. So I could, I can keep uh, working in this or going to an, another uh, document. I can also, if I want, I can um, uh, decide I want to actually take the image here. Maybe I want to grab this chart so I can go here to get image snapshot and then put um, grab that image and create it as an image quotation. And again, I can describe it here. Um, I can add it to my outline um, and so on. Now, another... Um, thing you can do too is uh, you can also have your own thoughts or ideas. So maybe there's some of you reading this, you're like, oh, I have to remember um, this topic because this is going to be important for my lit review or for my research. So you can create your own core statement. Um, so I can type in um, what I want to write and Uh, again, I can keep it, um, oh, <laughs> I can keep it, um, again, I'll just keep putting in the same place so we can see them and so on. So it's a way to sort of, uh, it's part of that critical reading part, I think, because you're going to ask yourself questions or maybe you want to remind yourself about something you read. Um, you can also uh, write a summary for the whole um article here. So if I go here and go new and I go to a summary, this is allowing me to write a summary about my thoughts. So that critical reading or making sure um, you're understanding if this is a good source for you as part of your lit review. So um, or maybe I would have article name here and then take that part where um, you know, Jessica talked about, um, I, wrote, I wrote it down here, that matrix, you could do part of the matrix here, you know, the study purpose, the methods, the results, the conclusion. Um, so you could start writing that here um, to start organizing yourself. Um, okay. Uh, so that's how you can work in the document with Satavi. Uh, and I just want to go back here. Um, one thing I meant to show you earlier is I can also bring in, like, assign the articles to different parts of my outline. So I want to make sure this is in my key themes. So get the citations for that. Uh, so again, it's a way to bring in thinking about the articles, maybe at a holistic level, like what I think these are different parts in the outline that are going to help me. Um, so when I go to start working on that rough draft, uh, I have all that there. Um, just want to make sure. Uh, and then now what I want to do is I can actually go to a Word document, which I have open. And Satavi has a Word add-in. So I went to Satavi, I went to Satavi Pane, and I brought up the, the the Word the project in Satavi I was working in. So I have all my references here. So I can start if I want double clicking and uh, bring them in. 
So you can see it's starting to build that reference for me. Um, if I want to do that, uh, but oh, okay, I'm going to actually believe that's why I'm confused the next part. So that I can also go to my knowledge items. So right here is I can start bringing in the parts of uh, whatever I worked with the Satavi. So whatever I had written in Satavi comes in and then it also starts building out that bibliography. Uh, but if I want, I can also bring all of this in um, at once. Sorry, I need to go here. So I can bring all the categories in at once. So you can see it's building that outline for me that I just created. So within seconds, I really have a, uh, a working rough draft. So what's great is you never have a blank page. You know, you're starting, and sorry, that will come down. Um, the reference, these are generally down below, but I started doing it there. So that's why it's there. Um, and then you can start uh, looking through and deciding, you know, how to build on this, right? This is just a rough draft. So you're going to have to put it in your own words, but what's nice, you have the citations already there. So right now I'm in APA, but um, I could change it. There's thousands of citation styles already built into Satavi. So for example, I'll just uh, change it to another one and you'll see um, it changes automatically and I'll, then I'll go back to APA. And, and it also changes cite citations. Um, you can also get to anything um, that you want to review in Satavi by clicking on this link. So if I go back to Satavi, it'll bring me to what I want to review. So it always links back to your project in Satavi. So with that, um, we're doing breakout sessions after this, and I'll go into uh, more detail on how to use Satavi then. So but I'll let Laura take over. Great. Oh, Thanks, I, you know what I forgot to do, though? Let me just show. I'm, I'm yeah. I forgot to do one thing. Um, and this is this is important to show the power of using in vivo and Satavi together. So I can share this project um, with in vivo just by clicking share with in vivo um, and the project is being shared. And then it will tell me ready to go and use it in vivo that easy. And that's what Laura is going to show you now because she has this project already um, loaded in in vivo. That's great. Thanks so much. I'm just going to turn on my screen and also get my little annotate spotlight on. And here we go. So, um, you know, as Stacy showed and Jessica talked about, you are, when you're doing the lit review portion of your research, you are going to want to spend a lot of time reading, thinking, uh, taking notes, being very uh, systematic and thorough in your note taking. And although there are um, old school ways of doing it, which we heard about, you know, on Word documents or Google Docs or taking notes on the docs themselves, and there's um, the benefit of being able to take that kind of notes in Satavi, what I wanted to show you is the ways that you might think about doing that also in NVivo. If you have the benefit of using Satavi, then you'll be able to bring that um, in uh, all of the notes that you've taken in Satavi. You'll be able to bring those in pretty seamlessly into NVivo, especially if you're using the latest version of NVivo 14. If you are not using Satavi and another reference management uh, software, you would be able to also bring those into um, NVivo, depending on the software that you're using. Or perhaps you've done things the kind of old fashioned way and you have electronic documents saved in various file folders on a, an external hard drive or your computer, that kind of thing. So just to show you what I have in this project, I want to let you know that I'm actually using NVivo 14 for Windows, and this is the latest version of NVivo, so that's what you're seeing here. If you're using, if you already have NVivo and you're using um, different versions of the software, like NVivo for Mac, or older versions of the software, 
then you'll see it, things may look slightly different. But um, today I'm using NVivo 14 for Windows. And I want to pick up where Stacy left off. If I was using Citavi as my reference management software, and um, I had shared the references as Stacy did share with NVivo, then I would go into the import tab of the NVivo main window here and add from Citavi. And when I add from Citavi, it's going to pull up um, some of the projects that are available to me. And I would bring the references in this way. I'm not actually going to do that for this part of the demo, but in the breakout session, I will go through this a little more step by step. But in order to kind of just give you a tour of what NVivo looks like and how the references could be managed, um, no matter if you're using Citavi or other types of software, uh, I wanted to just show you what the project looks like once it's been um, created by adding some references. So if I'd been adding the references from Citavi, one of the first things that happens, and this blue bar here on the left-hand side is called the navigation bar, and it's a list of all of the folders and all of the items that have been imported into the project or created in the project. So up here in my files folder, there is a folder created called references. And when I import from Citavi or I import from the other types of software, this type of folder gets created and it will again, may change depending on the software you're using, but bring in the PDFs that you might have attached to your references um, in the, the bibliographic software. By the way, if you're using other types of um, software, you can import and pull down here. And I know that people use Mendeley or Zotero, some of those other programs, and there's a window that opens to um, walk you through the import of those. So, in my references folder, here are all the references that got imported from Citavi, and I can actually see them. If I double click to open them, I could see the references one at a time. So in Citavi, I might have been taking notes and um, bringing in quotes and that kind of thing. Or if I'm using other software, I might have um, already started to think about and read the articles in um, a different way. But one of the things that um, is really important to see is, is kind of the notes that you've been taking about your um, articles as you're reading them. So down here under the notes section in this folder, there are a number of folders created and some of these automatically on the import. And in this memos folder, you're going to see there's a number of subfolders. In the reference memos, if I double click on that to open, I can see that for this article, a memo came in and it had some of the information that was um, uh, attached to that article in the reference management software. Almost all of the bibliographic software bring in the abstract of the article. So I'm just waiting for that memo to open. So you might see something here. And this is probably a link that was created when I was doing my um, note taking in Citavi. So it would be a, a summary. And I can actually export these memos as Word documents. So that's a really important point. And I'm going to show you some other ways to use the memos um, as you continue to read and think about your articles. The other part I wanted to show you is that all of the bibliographic information attached to the article, um, if you're using the software, um, it will come in on what's called a reference uh, classification sheet. And you can see that open here. And you can see that there are a number of different um, types of um, metadata that are attached to the article. So that comes in as part of the bibliographic software if you're using it. If you're using just you know, uh, articles that you've um, saved on your computer, you would probably have to create something like this yourself. So in NVivo and in qualitative research, we often use a process called coding to gather bits and pieces of an article or a piece of data or the literature in a lit review. And we put it together in what is called a one place that we call a code. When we use Citavi to, um, to begin our lit review, 
And Vivo creates a code system based on the category system that Stacy showed in the knowledge organizer in Citavi. If that has uh, been the way we started our lit review, then you'll see that that same outline and the types of quotes that were um, coded um, or highlighted that she dragged over to the knowledge um, categories are created there. Now, mine look a little bit different than hers because I was working on an older version of the uh, library when I was creating it yesterday. But you could go through and open these subcategories and have a look at what's in them. And when we have a code, I wanted to show you just what it looks like inside a code. You would gather up all of the information that's been um, recorded to this kind of um, code or the, the place where we put any of the information that we think is relevant to this topic called coastal communities. And I'm opening up a code here to show you what it looks like. So in this um, code, I currently have two references or two chunks of text um, from these various articles. This one comes from the Izzo and Doubleday article. This one comes from Andrews, Bennett, and so on. In the breakout session, I'm going to show you how you can, um, well, more uh, about that probably tomorrow, show you how you can actually create this kind of coding structure. If you're not using Citavi, you would simply come in and start to create a similar structure here by creating your own codes. So if I have a reference like this um, first one here open and I was interested to actually see what's in that article and read it, maybe um, begin to take notes or summary notes a little bit more, I can have that article open and begin to read it and do some coding and I can actually continue to code. I'm not bound by the codes that were created uh, when I imported the references. So I could come in through here and perhaps I'm interested in coastal communities and I can see that there's some information here about coastal communities and oh, and my mouse is pretty sensitive there. Let me go back up um, here about coastal communities and I can just drag it over and it will get added to my code and then become part of um, the information that I'm gathering for this um, key theme of coastal communities. So in the breakout session, we'll um, talk a little bit more about this kind of thing. And tomorrow's breakout session, I will show you how to create some of these codes and do the coding with a little more um, time spent on that. So I also wanted to take you down then through, oh, I wanted to show you that the coastal communities code has changed. Hold on. There, there's that uh, reference that I just coded to it. So if I've got some note taking already started in Citavi and I want to continue that process of coding and reading a bit more about coastal communities, I can do that inside Envivo. We heard from uh, Jessica the importance of taking good notes and really being systematic about the way you write those notes. And one of the advantages of using a software like and Vivo to do that, no matter which reference management software you're using, is this ability, I think, to create memos. So for instance, I might want to have um, uh, memos that are attached to or uh, referencing a certain theme. So let's say I know the coastal communities um, theme is one that's really going to be important. I read a lot about it um, even before I got started. And now as I'm continuing to read, you know, I can see that it's more important. I can create a memo in Envivo that is linked to this um, code where I did all of the coding about coastal communities. And I can begin to summarize my notes as I'm reading them and putting in key quotations. So I might have started that process in Citavi, or if I'm using other reference management software, I would want to create a memo and come in here and begin to summarize the kinds of information that I'm seeing and maybe create some of those paraphrases. And if I'm using Envivo for Windows, I can even put exact links to exact quotes that I would like to include. 
Let's say also that as part of my um, paper that I wanted to make an argument for the type of research that we're doing, I might also be looking at the various methods that people have used to do this research, and I see a gap in the methods. As I'm looking across all of that information, I see a real gap. I could create um, what is called, um, and I did this using a template, I'm going to show you that in a moment, but using the kind of outline that uh, Jessica showed, I might have a template that kind of gets me, forces me to write my memo in a certain way. So here's the claim that I'm going to have. Here's the couple of pieces of evidence that I found. And the beauty of this is that you can actually, and I'm just going to um, show you here, you can export those memos as Word documents, and it will bring in uh, um, the links to the evidence, either the whole paper or a certain part of that paper. Again, this feature is available in NVivo for Windows. If you're using NVivo for Mac, there's a couple of workarounds that I would suggest for that. But I wanted you to see that taking those notes inside NVivo where you actually have access to the literature as you're coding and as you're reading and thinking, and then you can even create memos that allow you to um, write in a very systematic way. You export those memos and they also start to become part of the um, draft that you're working on. So, um, and a suggestion might be to create a memo template that lays out the key features, let's say for the meal plan, if you wanted to practice writing in that kind of um, paragraph style that Jessica showed. And if I have a memo template, it simply works like a Word document template. Um, if it's gonna open for us here, let's see. There we go. There it is. I've got a memo template, main idea, evidence, analysis, link, and lead. If I wanted to start a new paragraph summary in here, I could um, just copy this memo and then rename it and begin to write in here. One of the benefits of doing something like this inside NVivo is that you can link directly to the quotes and the evidence that you've already got gathered in your project. And it's all in one place for you to revisit. So beyond that note taking, when you're at that stage of, of wanting to synthesize the literature, pull all of the things together that you've read from across many different sources, you then may want to come in and look at um, how certain words are used, any trends or patterns, gaps in the literature, those kinds of things. And um, one of the, the strengths of NVivo is being able to use the queries for this kind of exploration. So in the interest of time, I actually created a few um, queries in advance, but I wanted to show you what those queries look like when you run them inside NVivo. So one of the first things I always do when I have a new set of literature is to run what's called a word frequency query. And a word frequency query, I can set it up to tell NVivo exactly where I want it to search. And it's going to look across all of the sources or all of the documents that I've asked it to search. And it's going to count up the number of times words are used. And this kind of word frequency query can be a really helpful tool. I actually grouped similar words together here. So changing is change, changing, you know, it's got multiple um, uh, stemmed words included on this line. And I can take a look at this list and see what words are coming up frequently. And I'll often look at that to see if I'm surprised by any of them or if there's something missing that I thought would be here and so on. And the visual that's um, associated with a word frequency query is a word cloud. And I bet a lot of you are familiar with word clouds. They are, when created in NVivo at least, a, representati a representation of the frequency. So the font that's in the middle of the word cloud and bigger font or different colored font are the words that are most frequently used. And the ones that are on the outside are used less frequently. And although you may not be including a word cloud in your dissertation, it can be a helpful tool to really help you think through are, what are the words that are being used frequently? Are there things missing? What else should I be looking for? And I have used word clouds quite effectively on poster presentations or 
a PowerPoint presentation back to a committee to once people understand what they represent, it can be a very effective way of using different word clouds that represent different um, time periods in the literature or different countries in the literature to show you the different words that um, were used frequently in those articles. One of the other things that you can do is run a text search query in NVivo. And a text search query allows you to look for terms um, that are within a certain document or across all documents, that kind of thing. Very much like find in um, Word, let's say. And if I was looking for the word coastal here, I could come and see across all of the articles where that word is used a lot. That gives me a bit of a clue about which articles are going to potentially have the most information about that topic if I'm interested in it. And not only that, if I open it on this side, I can actually see where those words are used in context and explore that and capture it a little bit more um, if I'm um, really interested in coastal communities, I can actually ask NVivo to save these results all in one place or one code all at the same time. So if there's a few of those words that are coming up frequently that I think are really important to the research, then I would be able to run word frequency query to get a list of those words, run a text search query and multiple text search queries to get um, uh, gather up all of those frequently used words in their own codes at the same time. And then another tool that can be really helpful if you're actually looking for trends or patterns or those kinds of things is to use what's called a matrix coding query. And a matrix coding query allows me to separate out a theme or a code or different things by the um, uh, year, let's say, or any of the bibliographic information, the metadata that came in as part of the references, I might be interested to see if um, that word coastal was actually trendy in a certain um, year or period. Now, this can be a little deceptive. This is showing me the number of references or the number of times the word was used. And I might at first make, and this might be a bit hard to see, I'm not sure if I can make it bigger, but um, you're seeing 20 in 2010 and 128 in 2020. And I might make a leap saying, oh, that might have been a really important year, but I want to just switch my uh, display here up to the number of files coded. And that gives me a much better representation of, oh, this is one article and there was only one article here, but it was actually used a lot in the article that I had. So the last thing I just wanted to show you is the type of maps you might be interested in doing. And one of the, the cool things about NVivo, I think, is the ability to make maps, mind maps and project maps or concept maps. And this project map allows me to drag certain items like my code for the key themes onto a map and demonstrate visually, you know, the topics or the themes that are included within the key themes. When this map is inside NVivo, it's live to the data. So I could click through and explore more, or I can right click and export that map as a PNG or a JPEG picture file, that kind of thing. So I hope that gives you a sense of some of the things that you can do inside NVivo. In the breakout session, I'm going to um, kind of take you through step by step the things that I've just shown you here. So I'm going to pause here, Stacy. Thanks, Laura. Um, so just quickly, I'm going to um, share my screen and do just show you upcoming events and ways you can um, learn more about the software. So I did put this link in the uh, chat. So we're having a Luma Vera conference in September. We're asking for a call for presentations through July 14th. Uh, so the link um, in the PDF, learn more, you can go and apply. So please do. We'd love to get your presentations. This is just showing you all the Lumavero solutions. Uh, we talked about Satavi to help you with your lit review. We work with iTracks. They have a booth in the expo too to help you collect data online. 
in vivo transcription, um, in vivo desktop. Uh, Laura just showed you that. In vivo collaboration cloud, now you can collaborate in real time on the same project. Um, so there's no more merging. You're working all together right away. Uh, and then Satavi is also going to help you with your writing. So in vivo 14 came out in March. So that's the latest version. Uh, some free resources to help you learn in vivo. And then we have our in vivo Academy. Laura is one of our trainers and um, we have online courses and also consulting. And the Loma Vero community, this is a great way to interact with other researchers. It's free. Um, you can join and you'll have more resources to learn the software. And uh, Loma Vero, this is our data landscape and all the different software solutions we have to help you. So that's all in the PDF handout too. So with that, I just want to thank everyone. And um, we're going now get off and go to the next sessions that start in a minute. So Laura will be doing in vivo and how to accelerate your lit review. And I will be talking more about Satavi and how you can use it for writing and reference management. So we'd love for you to join. And also don't forget to check out the expo booths. They're um, open until I, th I think three today. So thanks everyone. See you, see you on the other side.